people are making billions of dollars legally and other folks have had their lives ruined. Folks, we're talking about grief and loss and we're talking about Shikari Richardson, the record-setting sprinter. And we are always looking at things from a front seat life perspective. She has taken this the same way she runs. Whatever, this is who I am. You don't like it, you don't have to like it. This is me. And so I respect her for that. I respect that she has not apologized for who she is. She has not apologized for being her. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life. I'm your host, Kelly Marie, and I invite you to take this journey with me. We're going to be talking about all things mental health and emotional well being. You see, I am a overcomer. If you are interested in figuring out the path for you to determine how and where you will drive your future, this is the place to be. We get to determine the ride. We may not get to determine the weather or who's on the road with us or if it's going to be a scenic route or not, but we are the drivers. So join me on this ride, Living the Front Seat Life. Hey, good people. Welcome back to Living the Front Seat Life. I am your host, Kelly Marie, and as always, it's a pleasure. A big shout out to Jazzy T, the ultimate podcast producer, and to Lisk. So today, um, it was not intentional, you know, that this topic is coming up. Um, I wanted to wait until I brought back our sports analyst, Robert Devereaux, um, to talk about mental health in sports, but... We are confronted with, you know, yet another situation and um, it's necessary to have the conversation, to continue to have the conversation. But first of all, Rob, welcome back. Thank you, Kelly Marie. I didn't think I was going to come back as soon as this, but I thank you for the invitation once again. Always, always. So I want to jump right in, right? We have a, a lot to talk about folks, we're talking about grief and loss. And why are we talking about grief and loss in sports? Because it's back in the headlines. And we are always looking at things from a front seat life perspective, right? The decisions that we make, how we drive this journey, um, taking responsibility for our actions, being the ones that say yes, and the ones that say no, it's us. We are in control. We are make those decisions and we accept responsibility. Um, Growing up, my mom always said, you know, there's repercussions for your actions. And that was the teaching tool, you know, guide that she used when teaching me, you know, what decisions to make. Are the repercussions for your actions worth the decision? And so I'm, I'm sharing that with you because we're talking about Shikari Richardson, the record setting sprinter who has been disqualified from the, well, not completely from the Olympics, but it's on a 30-day suspension because she tested positive for THC. So this isn't about marijuana. This isn't the debate around, you know, THC and rules and, and which is a, a whole discussion in and of itself, but grief and loss and how we process grief and loss and why we are so hard on some people and not on others. So Robert, can you just frame for us the situation, um, how we got here, and and then let's take it from there. Well, pretty much the past couple of weeks, there has been the U.S. Olympic track and field trials. Um, It's pretty much a two-week event out in Eugene, Oregon. And during that time, um, Ms. Richardson, her specialty is the 100-meter dash. And throughout the heats and into the finals, She was just spectacular um, during those events, putting the world on notice that um, American sprinters are back. Um, The little backstory to that is there's always a battle between um, the U.S. and Jamaica when it comes to sprinters. But uh, Richardson, she pretty much put everyone on notice that in July during the Olympics in Tokyo, she is one to be reckoned with. Um, But after the trials... It had surfaced that she had tested positive for 
um, THC. So everyone was taken aback by that, trying to figure out why did she do that. So after subsequent interviews, it was um, revealed that she learned that her biological mother had passed. And not in the normal way where a family member or a doctor would say to, you know, pronounce that a loved one is passed away. She learned it from a reporter, some random reporter that she's never met, told this young lady that your, you know, her biological mother had passed away. And that's after all of the the back and forth and all these news reports. I think that's the part that's lost. How do you learn that someone who is a part of you has left this earth? And how do you compartmentalize with that? How do you deal with that and your immediate reaction? So for the world to, you know, to lash out at this young lady saying that was stupid, that was dumb. I would like to turn the mirror on those folks to say, well, how have you dealt with the passing of a parent, a sibling? And where did you learn it from? Was it just, was it put in a newspaper? Was a reporter announced that your mother had passed away? That hasn't been discussed. It's about how she has dealt with that and how we all deal with grief varies. But she is a young lady who is out there in the public, very flamboyant. So they dismiss her feelings as a human being. And this is where we at at this moment in time. Thank you so much for bringing everybody up to speed. You touched on grief and loss and and that really is the heart of the conversation. Um, and the very important piece of how she learned about the death of her biological mother. Now, it's been reported, it's always been reported um, and written about that it was her biological mother. Those were the words used, biological mother, that has passed away. So we immediately know that there are some, I, I don't want to use the word issues, but it doesn't fit the traditional, you know, of course, using air quotes, the traditional family model. But it really is a normal model um, when you consider families are families, people are people, human beings are human beings. What I appreciate about Miss Richardson is that she at no point, she did ask for forgiveness, but she did not apologize for who she is. She has not apologized, nor should she. She has not apologized for the decision that she made. She let people know, I am dealing with something pretty much the same way a lot of other people are dealing with something. I am human. You're human. I'm you. I just run faster. Right. And so, you know, talking in pre, you know, our, our, our pre uh, podcast meeting, um, how that resonated with both of us. And when you look at living the front seat life, it is acknowledging, right, that we are all human. We all have to, to drive this life. We all have to, to go through this journey the best way we know how, the best way that we can. And how dare we um, demean and criticize a human being for processing grief and loss? We don't know her support system. We don't know, you know who is in her corner. We see pictures of her and her grandmother. We don't, we don't know her life, nor is it our business. Did she run? Did she run fast? Kudos and congratulations. Thoughts? It's like when you watch sports, when you watch movies or whatever, sometimes you look at those who are performed in a different light. And sometimes we do not put ourselves in a situation. This situation that Ms. Richardson is in, I, disclosure for myself, um, I, my father passed away when I was at school. And I didn't learn it from a family member. Um, I learned it from my roommate. And uh, my sister called, tried looking for me to tell me that our father had passed away. Um, I didn't, I wasn't mad that my roommate told me. Um, in fact, it kind of eased the blow for me. But I, I remember like it was yesterday, I was, walking um, by the student union and I started crying. And it was other emotions that was attached to that, but I had the luxury of being by myself, 
walking at night. So that's how I was able to process it. I didn't have a camera and a microphone stuck in my face. And it pains me that, you know, these reporters and these pundits are out here saying, you know, it's like shame on you for smoking marijuana. How dare you? I'm sorry. We have all been 21 at one point in time. So you're just going to sit up here and tell me that you were the best, most honest, most forthright 21 year old that walked the planet Earth. Right. <laughs> I think not. So it just like I repeat, it pains me that, you know, these folks are on TV saying she should have known better. You don't know better because that doesn't happen every day. A parent doesn't pass away every day. A sibling doesn't pass away every day. We may prepare for it. We may think it's coming regarding, you know, terminal illness or what have you. But we never know when that day is going to come upon us. So for again, these pundits to be like, oh, she's disappointing. She, she lacked decision making. I say, damn you. You just went all the way in, just humanized this entire conversation. Most folks only have two parents and some of us are, are blessed to have more. Some of us feel that it's a curse, right? To have more, but this is not a situation that occurs in an individual's life generally more than twice. And to vilify someone for, first of all, doing something that is legal in many states, including the state that she was running in, it boggles my mind, right? Um, and again, I, I didn't want to go down the THC marijuana rabbit hole, but people's lives have been ruined behind the use of marijuana and THC products. And other people have become more wealthy behind the sale of the very same products. And I'm not talking about the illegal products that get here however they get here. I'm talking about the Gap weed stores, no, you know, disrespect to Gap, but the Gap-like stores, right? These cool, posh, little THC medical marijuana spots. And people are making billions of dollars legally and other folks have had their lives ruined. Now, her perspective has been, she has taken this the same way she runs, right? Like, whatever, this is who I am. You don't like it. You don't have to like it. This is me. And so I respect her for that. I respect that she has not apologized for who she is. She has not apologized for being her. And we have to accept that, right? But going back to the conversation that we had about Naomi Osaka and support systems, track and field is also a, a lonely sport. You have teammates, you know, but this is not a team sport. So you don't have the same sort of protections, again, that one would have with a football team or basketball team or, you know, soccer team. So with Ms. Richardson uh, last year, she was running for Louisiana State University, LSU. Um, she spent one year at LSU on their track and field team. Then after that year, she went pro. So as you mentioned, as a pro sprinter, you have your coach and you may have other folks who are in the same discipline as you that's being trained by that one particular coach. Depending if your coach is famous or not, it just may be you, the coach, and three other folks. Depending on your relationship with the other competitors, it might just be very nine to five-ish where you just see them at the track and you go about your business where you don't really talk to them. So you're really on your own. So looking at the trials and also looking at the Olympics, you will find, name dropping, NBC, they will always jump into the crowd to show that person, be it the significant other or the parent or their high school coach or what have you. That's the storytelling, that's the narrative of the Olympics. So in a um, sleight of hand type of way, yeah, NBC is, for lack of a better word, pissed. Because Ms. Richardson 
represented a, like you would say, in air quotes, a story, a really good story for them to amp up and play out on their NBC and on their apps during those two weeks of the Tokyo Olympics. So with her not being there, that is a storyline gone now. So yeah, you lost your biological mother, but you know what? You kind of messed up our storytelling. So that's some of the energy that I got when they were, when NBC along with others was reporting this story. So it was like, forget that this young lady lost a parent. You're messing up our money. You messing up our storytelling. You messing up, you know, another person that we can place out there to get eyeballs on our TV for those two weeks. And um, going back again to who she is as a sprinter. A sprinter is a lonely out front type of competition. The 100 meters is the number one. That's the pinnacle of viewing and title you know those they throw out there the fastest man the fastest woman on earth so she is in a competition where they would show it live but also they would show it on repeat in prime time because the 100 meters is the glamorous race and she's a glamorous person like i said with no apologies fingernails hair eyelashes and so with that, we see that this is a conversation that needs more discussion. This is, is a conversation that we need to dive further into. So we're going to come back for a part two. Um, I want to make sure that we bring in, look at this a little bit historically and discuss why this is an issue. And I say this, by this, I mean the way in which we handle mental illness, mental health, grief and loss in sports really is a, a, a mirror to how we handle it in day-to-day -day life. These are still just people. And so you consider Michael Phelps and, and um, Ricky Williams from back in the day, uh, the football player, and the, the, the purpose for the use of this particular substance. Again, alcohol is a non-issue. Um, that's acceptable. You know, other, fo other drugs are acceptable. But this very basic, um, easy to access substance is not something that's acceptable, but it's acceptable in our day to day lives. How many people are going to work doing their job just fine and processing grief and loss, working through mental illness issues, working through mental health challenges and still functioning, still able to excel at the work that they do? So there's there, there's more to discuss and we will do that in our next episode but before we go Robert any closing thoughts um just on this piece I guess not closing thoughts but any maybe uh thoughts to get people thinking for the next part of our convo I believe when you look at as far as what we just discussed about grief and loss you cannot put a exact way to respond everyone will respond differently and people need to remember that, that what you do in your household is going to be different than what the next person does in their household. Um, but looking forward, when you talk about um, the method, when we're talking about medical marijuana, you know, you've mentioned that, yeah, that's a deeper rabbit hole because how the United States views it in its various states and how is it elevated or demonized in whatever state, county out there in the United States. It's a deeper question that we have to look at. Thank you so much for being here. And folks, as always, if you are in crisis or you need someone to talk to, please call the Suicide Prevention Helpline at 1-800-273-TALK. 1-800-273-8255 or text HOME to 741-741. Both numbers are free, they're confidential, and available 24 hours, seven days a week. If you need resources, but don't know where to go, try dialing 211 or going to 211 in your browser. Until the next time, I encourage you to be the light.